and uh, to gather together in unity. So I encourage you to join us there. Hey, I want to give you a little update uh, just before I get to the word here um, about the Jeremiah 29 initiative and kind of where we're at and uh, cast a little vision and um, just have you join with us. So really this whole Jeremiah 29 initiative has to do with this verse right here which says, seek the peace of the city and pray to the Lord for it for in its peace you will have peace. Like we have a responsibility to impact our city. And uh, one of the things we're doing with all of our property here is developing it, developing it in a way that would be attractive, that people would come and, uh, and be here, and, um, and, and we would have an opportunity to impact them with the love of Christ. And uh, so even this last week, I mean, that one little day, two days when it was really nice out, we had just a little blurp in the weather. Uh, let's let it stay, please, Lord. And uh, man, we had fam- just families making their way over here and playing on our, our new play set. Um, you know, as soon as the weather is turned, they've been there. And uh, what that means is we don't want to just welcome them here, but we want to interact with them over time. And uh, so we're developing uh, grounds for people to come be part of. It's a park-like setting in some degree, um, one that the church will use, but one that our community will use. And people are using the hike bike trail every day. And, um, and so uh, they're just, people are on our property a lot. And we believe that when you step on our property, have you prayed for our property? Have you prayed for grace? That when people step on the property, they would encounter the love of God. That's one of our goals here with this whole thing. And so in, in our whole vision, this, this uh, first screen, one that's on the screen has to do with um, um, a couple of playgrounds that we're putting in. This one over here we've already put in. This playground that we hope to get in yet this year. Um, some space for some of the events that we're going to do. A pavilion down the road and an amphitheater uh, for bigger events. And then the hike bike trail um, that got put in. And then over here, um, a place for the greenhouse, the gardens, an orchard, and a variety of other things that we can do um, for our community. And so um, the next slide there shows that uh, phase one we completed in 2021, uh, which had a lot of things. We had a $140,000 budget. We only spent 133, and uh, we were able to get some things done, like the bike trail, the initial driveway, putting a well in, and some sprinklers, um, electricity, some landscaping, all kinds of things that we did there with phase one. And so we're in the middle of phase two, and uh, we're hoping to finish phase two this year and then have an opportunity to let us develop that phase uh, before we jump into anything else. But we really want to finish phase two here. And as we're hitting the spring, um, there's things that we didn't quite get finished up last fall that we want to hit hard as we get started here and, um, and move forward. And so phase two um, has to do with the Grace Gardens, um, the greenhouse, uh, putting a well in, which we put a second well in over here, um, some flower beds, the garden and orchard, uh, the zero to five playground, which is the barn and tractor here, the six to ten playground, which is the letters that spell the word grace that will be lit up as people drive by them, they'll see them, and they'll just be a great place for people to come and, and just, I mean, think about it, just, just prophetically declaring grace over our city. With the people, just there's a prophetic thing that God will do through that. Um, our rear entrance to the back of our, our building so that we um, can help get people in and out of the building with a little bit of parking out there, um, completing all the dirt moving and grading and the additional sprinklers that we'll need to care for the grass and the lawn. And so putting these wells in is going to help us be able to run sprinklers in, and, um, at a very cost-effective rate. And uh, the additional electrical lighting. It's $565,000, which is a ton of money. Um, we're at somewhere around 385000 um, right now for phase two, which is wonderful, and uh, we're getting close to the end um, of that. Uh, what's that next slide say, uh, Caitlin? So here we are in play, phase two. Here's what it really is. It has to do with playgrounds and gardens. And uh, here's those, that playground that spells out the word grace. These are, these are about eight foot tall and then uh, about six feet wide and then up to about 12 feet deep some of them, and they're being specifically manufactured and designed for us, and it's taken a little bit of time because they're getting the right manufacturers and engineers to um, make this happen all at um, playground safety standards. But one thing I felt like the Lord told me was that, that he wanted things to be unique on our property. In other words, that our playgrounds wouldn't look like any other playground in town, that they would have a unique cap- capability to them that people would come and and participate. And so I want to uh, just take a couple minutes and share uh, kind of where we're at in phase two and what we're, our plan is. And so here's a, uh, a really rough, immature drawing that yours truly did. Um, this this gray, gray box right here is the greenhouse that's sitting out there, which is just unbelievably producing right now. 
Um, we're already harvesting lettuce and radishes and all kinds of things that are producing. And it's, it's so amazing to watch life appear in this building. And um, it, at times when, there, when nobody, when you shouldn't be with the weather, right? And uh, a couple of our trees that have been sitting dormant that we weren't sure, like these trees we planted, are they going to do anything? And then, boom, two weeks ago, all of a sudden, full of leaves and, uh, and blooming and just things are happening in the greenhouse. It's, if you have not been in the greenhouse, if you've not taken a tour of the greenhouse, you should go take a tour of it because it just, it's a, you, you have to see it to be part of it to understand what's happening there. And the thousands of plants that we have growing right now, uh, many of them that are going to go in garden beds. So we're getting ready to build garden beds all the way across the front of this. That's what these little blue boxes are. They're garden beds, some of them of different sizes, that will be used both for us as our congregation and then also some that will be made available for the community um, to come and use, people that can't have a garden in their property for whatever reason. And uh, we want to provide space for that. Some of the plants that we're growing in the greenhouse right now, we're just going to fill up a lot of these beds because we don't know Um, people aren't going to join us right away because they don't know they're going to be able to. But we're going to leave some available, and hopefully over time, more of these will be used by people in our community. And uh, there's there's a couple things in the vision of the greenhouse and the garden. And um, one of them is just sustenance, like an ability to produce um, for families in tough times, for just kind of where we're at in the world right now. Um, I mean, honestly, if I were to tell you the truth, I think there's room for three of these on the property if if we got them developed right and we're able to take care of them that really could produce things. Um, we're hoping to support some food pantries in town that need some fruits and vegetables. One of the things that they really struggle in their food pantries is fruits and vegetables, so we're hopefully that we're going to be able to provide some of that and uh, to help families. So one thing is sustenance and helping families. A second thing is just building community. And so working in the garden and working with your hands is something that, that really is very life-giving. And uh, doing it with other people and building community, it's going to be a great place to build community within our congregation and within our city. And so building community. And the third thing, it really has to do with inspiration and education. That when you walk through the greenhouse, there's an inspirational value to dream beyond what you think is possible. Because really, in Nebraska, it's not possible to grow citrus, right? And we're going to grow citrus, there's, there's six orange trees and lemon trees and lime trees that are growing right now, things that we can't grow in Nebraska. And, and when, when you see that something that's impossible becomes possible, it allows you to begin to dream. And I can't wait for about a year, year and a half, when these things are really producing and we're able to bring in preschools and elementary students and let them begin to dream and be inspired. So what we do is not for us. It's for our city. It's for others. Who, who is waiting who is sitting there and has a dormant idea that God wants to release into the earth? We talk about this a lot in regards to lives that are being lost through abortion. What creativity and what things, life-changing things are being lost today in the world through abortion? We, I don't think we ever could imagine the inventions the betterment for the world, the creativity, the things that God wants to put in people's lives, the gifts and the abilities that are being lost. And I wasn't going to talk about that, but it's just a good reminder. Um, so in this, in this area, so we're really looking to develop all this ground out in front of the greenhouse and get it ready to go. Some of these yellow spots is just where there's going to be all kinds of different flowers that are going to be planted and growing and blooming at different times and a little bit of a gazebo area where it be some all kinds of creative things that are happening. These green circles are orchard trees. These are some grapevines and um, just all the things that we can do. And so these black lines are like sidewalks. So we're getting ready to um, do a couple things. One is to extend the parking lot. So our parking lot needs to go about seven more feet, which will allow us to angle park there. And then also we're going to put a sidewalk barrier that will create a barrier and then, and then all the landscaping to do that as a really good, beautiful entrance into the greenhouse and the gardens. Uh, we need to finish all the grading of the dirt, finalize like how are we going to drain all this water that's coming off the parking lot. We figured like an inch of water is only 35,000 gallons of water that's all running towards the greenhouse, so we need to move that to the right places. And, uh, I mean, do the math, 10 inches of rain is, yeah, and so it's concrete, it's all going to go somewhere. And uh, so we need to move all that water. Um, establishing a, lo- a road to the lower level, which um, is, we, we weren't able to quite get the grade right over here, over right really close to the building. So um, on the other side, we've already planned on putting a road in um, that's going to work around the greenhouse and then a driveway that goes all the way to the back doors. And so we want to begin working on that road, um, just like a gravel road to get started and 
get it firm and established before we do anything else. And then um, we were able to purchase a uh, outdoor restroom, men's and women's restroom, like kind of like a it's sitting out there by the garage. Kind of looks like a shipping. It's made out of like shipping container, and um, it's really done inside with a, a nice restroom that we'll be able to hook the water up right to our well. But then we need to figure out what are we going to do with the sewage. <laughs> So we got to get that out of there as well. But um, really being able to have a restroom over here um, for all the people that work in the greenhouse and the gardens, I think it was a great deal um, what we were able to do there. So that's with the greenhouse and the gardens. And then the playgrounds, uh, we want to extend a sidewalk from the front of the building around to the barn and the tractor so people can get there. Um, people that are walking their strollers, you'll see people just hop off and push their strollers through the grass, which works. But uh, we want to be able to um, have a nice entrance over there for the, the preschool playground. Um, there's some little sidewalk entrances to where the Grace Playground is going to go, and then we need to purchase and install the Grace Playground, which is kind of the, the, the big purchase. So I'm extending uh, an invitation to partner with us to finish phase two. All right, so 2023, we'd like to finish phase two. And so here's what we're looking for, and this is kind of a, a motto that I use with our interns and our residents and, and our staff that really God wants us to develop our head, our hands, and our heart. And I think we, we need all of you to use your head, your hands, and your heart in the development of the Jeremiah 29 initiative. And so heads, we're talking about people that are, have wisdom, using the mind of Christ, that which God has put in you, in you to help us correctly strategize the right methods of moving dirt and waterways and drainage and sprinklers that we need to put in. And the process is to solve problems and complete the right pieces in the correct order. So some of you, as I begin talking about this, you begin to ask questions. Your mind's already begin to roll, like, what about this and what about that and how do you deal with this and what are you going to do? Go and talk to Andy about all those things. <laughs> don't, don't come and talk to me, but do, yes, go talk to Andy about all those things because we want to get, we want to do things the right way. We, we want to do it right and we don't have all the wisdom for all the answers for all the stuff. We need our congregation and the wisdom of our congregation. We need you to participate in with what you have. It's not just like, well, Mitch and the staff will take care of it. No, this is something that I believe that if we'll wrap our hands around, you'll find creative ways and strategies to make it better and also to interact with people. And that's our heads. The second thing is our hands. And it's people that have the ability. So your hands, we, you have ability to do things. There's God has given you ability to do things, and I'd encourage you to use that ability to bless this place and the kingdom that God's put in you. And so use your ability, use your hands, to whether it might be serving in the gardens. And uh, listen, you don't have to know a lot about gardening to start. You'll learn. You'll start learning. It'll create a desire in you. Brian Bontz is overseeing the garden and the greenhouse, and he would tell you, I don't know a thing about the garden and the greenhouse. But he's overseeing it because he's a leader and he's an administrator and he's a creative thinker. And uh, I mean, how much have you learned, Brian, in the past couple months? More than the rest of my life. <laughs> about gardening. I mean, like, who knew? But there's some amazing things about, and what I've been learning is I've been just watching videos, learning things. Man, the, the incredible aspect of life. Life. So much. It will inspire you. I'll tell you, if you're a depressed person, go hang out in the garden. It'll inspire you. You'll have life come. You go serve in the garden. Help, help with building and planning the garden beds that are going to happen here in April and those spaces and getting things put in the right places. And I, I mean, I'm not the guy. To, I mean, you saw my creative drawing. I'm not the right guy to know where all these things go. But we need you to bring your input and your wisdom and to use your hands to serve. Maybe it's installing sprinklers. Maybe you can help us save a bunch of money because you know how to install sprinklers. We got a lot of sprinklers we need to install yet. We'd like to save some money. Maybe it's helping pour concrete in all these different places and just saying, you know what, I'm gonna give up a few hours of my time to go help pour concrete in some of these things that need to be done. And so that's how you can use your hands. And the last thing is your heart. So not only is it your, your wisdom and your ability, but it's your heart. It's, it's people who understand the vision and the potential to impact our city who can partner with us financially to help us finish phase two. And so... We're about $175,000 away from finishing phase two, which is more than all of phase one. And so it's, it's, and honestly, it's more than what I believe just our congregation can do. But I think there's a part that our congregation can do. And so what might, how God, might God use you to impact 
Carney through the Jeremiah 29, whether it's a one-time gift or a monthly gift. And so there's a handout that we gave you, that we gave out last May. And in there, there's a, there's a card you can fill out to say, this is what I can commit to. And I'd really ask you to pray and commit to. The one thing I thought that we would have is some people that would be able to commit monthly to something. And uh, we only have like seven people that are giving monthly towards Jeremiah 29. And like it might seem overwhelming to you, but maybe, maybe God would ask you to sacrifice a coffee a week. Maybe one coffee a week, which might be $25 a month. As simple as that, to say I want to pour into Jeremiah 29. And so really in our congregation we can begin to tackle some of these things. And so will you pray about it and commit to serving with your head, your hands, and your heart to help us finish phase two and invest in our city. Um, so I want to pray. I want to pray, and then, then we'll be done with this part. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for the vision that you have. It's your vision for this property. There is no doubt about it. You have confirmed it time and time again. Lord, there's some things in our humanness, humanness that we've gotten wrong, and there's some things that we've gotten right. But Lord, the, the one person that's always right is you. Lord, there's times where we've invited you into the process and there's times where we haven't. And so today I just want to invite you again and say, God, we just want to lay down our ideas and the way that we think things should go, especially me. I want to lay down my ideas. Lord, we want heaven's ideas. Lord, I pray for the people of our congregation that have the wisdom, the insight, and the ability to help us, to ask questions, to give creative ideas. Lord, that we would be able to finish phase two both from a labor standpoint and also a financial standpoint. God, we do ask for the finances, Lord, that you would finance your vision and your time. Lord, you know I'm not a patient man. But Lord, I know that it's all in your time. And so, Lord, we will step right in with you. But Lord, we do want to pray and ask, Lord, for the release of the finances. Specifically, Lord, I pray for the grants that, that we're in a new grant season. And specifically, Lord, I pray for grants for people that would look beyond a church and into a city and that they would partner with us financially through grants. God, would you open up doors and opportunities through grants, Lord, to help provide for your vision. And Lord, we pray for our community. Lord, we pray that there would be people that would come alongside us in the community that would wrap their hearts around what we're doing and that they would invest with their head, their hands, and their heart in what you're doing here. Lord, would you help each of us, even in, Lord, we, we, it's not hard to admit that we're in a season of inflation where everything costs more, and it would be really easy to not give. It would be really easy to hold back on our tithe, but then giving above our tithe makes it even harder. But Lord, with you, all things are possible. And so, Lord, we take that which we have in our hands, and we just ask you, Lord, what would you have us do? Lord, I just hold my hand out openly and I say, God, what would you have me do to partner with the vision that you have for this property to impact our city? Lord, would you help us with that? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 So you can fill out that card, drop it off in one of those boxes if, if God moves on your heart to do that. You can also write on it, um, if, if you have some ideas, if you've had some questions or ideas, write that on there, and, and uh, Pastor Andy will t get a hold of you sometime this next week. So, All right, turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 8, 23 minutes. Luke chapter 8, uh, page 588 on the Bible below you. And don't worry about all the empty chairs that you might see today. We've, we've um, actually, praise God, our average attendance has went up by about 75 since the beginning of the year and um, that's a great thing. So we, we added some rows. Some of you noticed that your knee room isn't quite what it was before. And so we've added some rows or some extra chairs in here for you. And, um, and so when you walk in the room right now, and so I just tell you, you don't just have to grab a set of chairs and set them up because there's plenty of chairs. So don't just, I know some of you just like to sit in the back. Would you please not just grab a set of chairs and set them up? Let an usher help you with that. That would be kind. We, we just want to do things with excellence. So, All right, I want to share a couple of verses with you as we jump in, and um, they're not going to be on the screen. So, Caitlin, these are not on the screen. I just want you to listen before we get to Luke 8. We're going to get there in about five minutes, maybe. I want to read to you out of Daniel chapter 7. I just want you to listen with your heart. 
This is about the Ancient of Days. Who's the Ancient of Days? Do you know? Jesus. Jesus is the Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days and the Son of Man. Here's what Daniel says. As I kept watching, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days, Jesus, took his seat. His clothing was white like snow, and the hair of his head the whitest, like whitest wool. Is that how you picture Jesus? His clothing was pure white, and the hair of his head was, white, was like whitest wool. And his throne was flaming fire, and its wheels were blazing fire. Evidently, the throne has wheels on it. Can you imagine this? Can you see it? Can you see this white Jesus clothed in white with white wool hair and his throne on fire, the orange of the fire and the flame shooting off it? And a river of fire was flowing, coming out from his presence. Thousands upon thousands served him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was convened and the books were opened. I watched then because of the sound of the arrogant words, the horn was speaking, the enemy. He's the arrogant speaker. As I continued watching, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was removed. But an extension of life was granted to them for a certain period of time. I continued watching in the night visions and suddenly like one, uh, one like a son of man was coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was escorted before him. He was given dominion and glory and a kingdom so that every people, nation, and language should serve him. Dominion. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. I want to remind you as I start today about dominion. The dominion of Jesus, the dominion of God, the dominion he has in heaven, the dominion, the kingdom that Jesus is establishing here on the earth. That God has established his dominion. He is the creator. He is Lord of all. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. Come on, praise God. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that won't pass away. Matter of fact, in Psalms chapter 24, it says this, the earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants, does that include you? Belong to the Lord. Here's the question I want to answer today. Whose is it? Whose is it? It's all his. The world and all of its inhabitants. The car is, the house is, the trees are, the cattle are, the flowers and the bees are, they're his. When I look at what I have and I ask this question, whose is it? There's a place in my heart where I have to settle to say it is the Lord's. It's all his, and any time he asks for it back, I should give it because it's his. And so we're talking about learning how to live under authority. And we answer this question about priority, what place is God in our life? What place should God have in our life? And we said that he's first place. And then we answer this question about who's right, that God is right, how often? All the time, that he's right all the time. And in this, in the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about submission and how if God is first place in our lives, we should have this reflexive response to him and his authority. It's a reflexive response. And what's happened when an authority walks in the room, there's a reflexive thing in your heart that just responds to it immediately. That's what submission is. It's not something you can be talked into. It's not something that, that uh, can be demanded. It's a response to the heart, to the position that someone has in your life. And if God is first, then we have this reflexive response to him with a heart of, of submission that says, yes, sir. And we talked last week about surrender and about surrendering our need to be right to the fact that God is right. And if God is right, that we'll walk in obedience to his word. God is in first place and God is right. That's the heart position of a believer. It's, it's our heart position. And so today, in answering this question, I want to answer this question, whose is it? It's another heart position. In my, it's, is, is my heart positioned to believe that all this stuff is his? Is my heart positioned to believe that it's his? 
Or, and if he asks me to use his stuff and to give his stuff, here's the question, will I trust that he will do with it what he desires? Will I trust? Where's my heart position? So let's meddle a little bit. Am I willing to share the bedrooms of my home? Is it his or is it too much of an inconvenience to have a trusted friend stay? It's a hard issue, really. We have this issue in life, mine, 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 mine. And really, whose is it? Am I willing to share my vehicle with somebody in need? Is it God's? Or is it too hard for me to entrust someone else with it when he asks? I'm not telling you just to do it because somebody needs it, but when he asks. Are we even willing to listen to what he might be asking? Do I ever even ask him when somebody has a need? God, what about mine? And how do I respond to what he says? Am I willing to share my resources, or in other words, his resources, with those who are in need in order to impact and build the kingdom? Am I willing to give my gifts and abilities, or the ones that he's given me, to be used by those who need it so that God can be glorified? Am I, what am I willing to do with what has been given to me? What I'm asking you is this question in your heart, because it's a heart issue about dominion, is whose is it? Whose is it? It's easy to simply say, well, it's all God's. But do I believe that it's really his? Do I really believe it? Because your belief has an action to it, and you all know my action is not to drink a Coke, but to drink a Pepsi. Because when you believe something, you put it into action in your life. It's what you do. And there are certain things that matter more about what you believe. And one thing is about whose is it. And every one of us are challenged, no matter how spiritual we think we are, we're all challenged with this question, whose is it? When God asks of something, when somebody's in need of something, and God says, hey, let them use that, how do I respond to that? Where's my heart? And so we've looked at submission, and we've looked at surrender, and I got one more S word for you today, and it's called steward. Stewardship. If it, whatever it is, is not mine and it is God's and I have it, then I am simply a steward of it. A steward or a manager, an administrator of what he's put in my hands. Psalm chapter 50 verse 10 through 12 says this, For every animal and the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains. I mean, just stop a minute for a minute. God knows every bird. Those ones that are flying over us right now? I know them all. And the creatures of the field are mine. And God goes on and he says this in verse 12. If I were hungry, I would not even tell you. For the world and everything in it is mine. It's all mine. God says it is mine. So who owns it all? So who's the owner? God is. So let's establish this first. Here's the first thing I want to establish today. I am not the owner. Say that with me. I am not the owner. How'd that make you feel? Your house, your car, your spouse, your kids. I am not the owner. That's like an issue to be settled in your heart when you ask this question, who's in it? And so if I'm not the owner, then there's only one other thing I can be if I actually have it. And that means, number two, I am a steward. Say that with me. I am am a steward. One more time. I am a steward. How'd that make you feel? (laughs) I'm a steward of what God has placed into my life. In Genesis chapter 1, God said this, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God has said, listen, it's all mine, but man, I'm going to let them rule over it. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Take dominion over it. In other words, steward what I have given you. It is already mine, and I put you in a place to steward it. And before the fall, it says rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. God had delegated the earth to us. And before the fall, we would rule it. We would have dominion without sin, which would mean we would care for it in a way and steward it in a way without the temptations of selfishness. But when sin came in, now we rule over the earth 
and all the things that have been given to us with the idea of mine. But God said, listen, it's not yours, it's still mine. It's all his. And he said, take care of it. Take care of what is mine. Steward it and manage it well. And the first question that we need to answer as a steward of the earth is this. How well am I taking care of it? How well are you taking care of what he's given you? How well are you taking care of where you live, the city you live in, the nation you live in, the earth that you live in? I'm not talking about being a hyper-environmentalist or an earth lover. But if we truly are called to steward the, steward the earth and to subdue it, then we do need to think about how we live in the earth. So let's, let's meddle a little more. Do I pick up trash? Or is it beneath me? What do I do when I see trash somewhere? We should pick it up, but do we? Pick it up. Or is it so-and-so's job, but what, what, if, what if I'm at Walmart and there's trash laying on the ground? Well, surely that's somebody else's job. What if you're walking through the school your kids go to and there's trash laying around? Whose job is it? To steward the earth. What do I do with trash? What, how do I handle trash in my home? Do I conserve anything? Or just blow it no matter the cost? Do I, do I conserve anything? Do I consider the ramifications of how I'm living in this earth? That has to do with stewardship. I'm asking myself this question. How do I treat what I have? How do I treat it? How do I treat what God has entrusted me with? With my home. God's blessed me with a home. How do I treat my home? Do I just let it fall apart? Or do I repair it and keep it in good standing and that it would be a place of blessing for all those that would come? Do I mistreat it or do I treat it well? What about my vehicles that I have? How do I treat them? The appliances that, that I have. All these blessings that we have in America that other people don't just simply have. I remember going in, in Honduras and uh, this village we were ministering to, and they literally all had fires going all the time. They had to tend the fire constantly. They, the fire, did, fire was important. They didn't want to go out. They didn't have ovens. They didn't have stoves. This is just a few years ago. They didn't have any electricity. Well, they might have had some electricity, but they, they didn't have any appliances. And so at the edge of their house, they had this fire that was always burning because you needed fire to do what? Boil water and cook food. And that fire, if it went out, how hard was it going to be to start a fire again? Hard. So they constantly had this pile of wood. And I mean, you couldn't be gone that long because you always had to be tending the fire. You had to get the fire going again. Why? So that you could eat that night. You didn't just get to walk in and turn the button. Turn the oven on. Turn the stove on, throw in the microwave. So if God has blessed you with all of those things, how do you take care of them? You slam them around, thinking that, ah, let's get a new one, throw it away sometime. How do I treat them? Do I care for them? Do I wash them? Do I fix them? Do I treat them kindly or do I abuse them? Do I drive them hard and beat them up and then get mad at God when they're not working and I need a new one? God, you said you would take care of my stuff. But I've been treating it so poorly, how could he take care of it? Do I take care of the family that God has put in me, put me in? No matter your position in your family, are you a taker or are you a builder and a giver? The first question of being a steward is, how do I manage the earth in which I live? How do I steward and manage what God has given me? The little, the tiny, the insignificant portion of this earth that I live on, because it really is pretty little. Do I value it? What kind of steward is it? Whose is it? And if it's the Lord's, if he were physically right here with me, would I do anything differently with it? Would I treat it any differently? Think about this. If you were going to go stay at somebody's vacation home, and you went and you stayed at their vacation home, and then before you leave, these were friends of yours, what would you do before you left? Would you just leave the trash there and gonna, you know, not make the beds and just leave the pile of wet towels there because you know they'll get to it in a few weeks when they get here? Or would you like, these are friends of mine, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to leave it the way, better than it was when I got here. Right? That would be stewardship. Okay, Luke chapter 8, page 588. It wasn't just five minutes to get there, it was about 15. But Luke 8, I'll read one story to you and then we'll... We'll be about done. Luke 8. The interesting set of verses here. 
starting in verse 1. Speaking of Jesus, afterward, he was traveling from one town and village to another, preaching and telling the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary called Magdalene. Seven demons had come out of her. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward. Susanna and many others who were supporting them from their possessions. Interesting set of verses. Mary Magdalene, obviously she, her life, seven demons came out of her. She was going to go wherever Jesus wanted to go. She wanted to stay free. Susanna um, and many other women that were going. But then in the middle it talks about this one lady. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward. This guy, Chusa, or however you say his name, was a steward. In the Greek, this word is a person who has been entrusted with the guardianship or supervision of another person's belongings. This is not a low-level servant. Chusa was a high-level dignitary and had authority to make decisions on behalf of Herod in regard to his personal fortunes. Similar to how Joseph was a steward in the house of Potiphar. Chusa served as the king's advisor and no doubt had opportunities to increase his own personal portion position as he lived in the atmosphere of affluence and had many high-ranking political connections as Herod's steward. Some even think he may have been the nobleman in John chapter 4 whose son was healed by Jesus. It might have been Chusa, we don't know. But Chusa's wife was Joanna, a woman who had been dramatically touched, affected, and changed by Jesus. And if Chusa was the man who, whose son was healed in John 4, it would be easy to imagine how, jo, how grateful Joanna would have been for Jesus for saving her child's life. Certainly, a person so impacted would want to use her fortune to make sure others could receive the same touch of God. The Bible doesn't tell us how Joanna made her first connection with Jesus, but apparently it changed her life. After that encounter, she saw it as part of her responsibility to give of her personal substance to financially support Jesus' ministry. And we see people giving to Jesus' ministry as soon as their life was changed. And Joanna was with Mary Magdalene and the other women who visited the tomb after Jesus rose again, the empty tomb. She was faithful to Jesus all the way to the end, even when it didn't look good. She was faithful. And when you think about what you have and the answer to the question, whose is it, and you think about it being the Lord's, how is your heart in that? How's your heart? Why would God entrust you with his stuff? Why would he entrust you with his stuff? 1 Corinthians 10 says, since the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it is the Lord's. I wanted to talk to you today about these things, our time, our treasure, and our talent, and maybe we'll get to those in the weeks to come. But I want to look at this one other scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. It says this, In this regard, it is required that managers be found faithful. That's, in other versions, that word managers is steward, because a steward is a manager. You're managing somebody else's stuff. In this regard, it's required that managers be found faithful. A manager is probably a better word in our context today. And God has asked us to steward or manage what is his, to simply manage what we have been given. And so I want to ask you one more question. Do you have any rules in your home? Yeah. Have you got some rules in your home? Yeah. Of course you do. You have a way of doing things. There are rules or standards in your home. If you have kids, you probably have house rules, right? How many kids like your house rules? A lot of them don't. But if you did, if you have house rules, you probably might have said things like this, like I would have. As long as you live in this house, you're going to live by my rules. Anybody ever said that before? Right, it's natural, right? As us as fathers, especially. In the same way, God has rules that he expects us to live by. There are. Even, even in his grace. What rules? Well, like his word. Like the law of love. And how he asks us to live by, which includes forgiving, releasing others from judgment, living by grace, just to name a few. Just to name a few things. God looks for the submitted and the surrendered, those who have obedience in their heart, who respect him, who honor his word, and follow his instructions. 
That, that's what God's looking for. It's similar to what a man, a man who is leading his household would have for children in his home. He wants to be respected as a father, right? He wants to be honored for his word. Like, hey, what I said mattered. And he wants those that are living with him to follow the instructions that are given. Isn't that what we want? We want to be respected. We want our word to be honored. And we want to them to follow our instructions. Now, the problem is we are imperfect people. And it can make those three things a little bit difficult because of our imperfectness. But God is perfect. God is perfect. So in this scripture, in this regard, it is required that managers be found faithful. I want to look at this word required for a minute. Required. What does it mean it's required? It's, maybe that's not a good translation really because in the Greek it's, it says something a little bit different. It says to seek, to search, or to look intensely for something. It means that God is making a concentrated, exhaustive, and thorough search in pursuit of stewards who are faithful. Nobody wants to bless an unfaithful steward. Nobody wants to bless that one that's working in their home as an unfaithful steward. Think about it. If, if you had given someone authority over all of your stuff, and you hire a manager who will handle your monetary investments, and if they are not doing a good job, you're not going to let them keep managing your stuff, right? So... I mean, hopefully, and some of us have maybe failed at this, put me in line, where, where maybe you asked a financial a manager, asked you, all right, what do you want to do with this investment? And you say, well, I want 10% of my money to be placed in this place that's risky. And they said, ah, that, it doesn't make sense. So they went ahead and put 50% in a risky place. They're not honoring you or your word, even if they were right. And that bothers you, doesn't it? Because they didn't honor you or your word. And they're not abiding by the rules that you set for them to manage your money. They're not living by those rules you gave them. And so if you've had a financial manager take advantage of you and you left that situation, you are diligent. So then you left it like, okay, this person didn't honor my rules or my word with my money, so now I'm going to find somebody else. What are you doing? You are diligently searching and looking for the right manager to handle your money. And I'm just talking about money here in this illustration, but we're talking about all the stuff that God's given us. That's, that's what this is saying, that God is searching. He's in pursuit of a steward that is faithful. Come on up, Abby. Second Chronicles chapter 16 says this, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those who are wholeheartedly devoted to him. Those who are devoted to him. Someone who will respect, honor, and abide by the rules of his house. In the Greek, the first part of this word steward is one who literally manages a household. The physical residence where the family resides in its residence. It means they manage the furniture, the finances, the property, and the household items connected to the family and the home. The possessions, the affairs, and everything else connected to that particular house or that household. And the second part of steward is one who dispenses or administrates. They follow what has been ordered and established the standards and norms that are firmly established and publicly accepted. It encapsulates the gatekeeper, the head janitor, the head cook, the chief accountant, not just the laborers, but rather administrators who have responsibility to know, respect, and follow the rules of the house. God is seeking leaders who know his rules and live by them who set themselves an as an example for others to follow, who teach others to live by the rules as well. What does God want you to steward? His word. If you steward his word, you will take care of the earth. You will steward your time, your gifts, and your abilities, and your treasure. You will be a lover of him, and you will be found faithful. We can't be stewards if we don't steward his word. We tell God that we're ready for the big promotion. We tell God that we're ready for the financial advancement. We tell God that we're ready for relationships. But it's not truthful if we don't steward his word. One more verse, and it's not, it's not on the screens. Many of you know it. Hebrews 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living 
and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of the soul and the spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Word of God. If you steward the Word of God, if you really steward the Word of God, if you become a manager of His Word and an administrator of His Word over your life, you'll begin to stop living by lies, living by truth. And the natural reflection of that is you'll begin to see what He has given you in a different light and you'll be, begin managing that differently as well. I want you to stand with me. I want you to ask a question as we close today. I want you to ask the Lord a question. She asked the Holy Spirit who's on this earth today. He's our helper. He's our comforter. He's our guide. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit this question. Is there any area in my life that I have been sloppy in obedience to the word? Let's just take 30 seconds and ask him, Lord, is there any area in my life where I have been sloppy in obedience to your word? in my life that I'm taking your word lightly? Is there an area in my life where I've been taking your word lightly? Maybe it's the truth about giving financially. Maybe it's the truth about stewarding my spouse. Maybe it's the truth about raising up my children. Maybe it's the truth about who he says that you are. Holy Spirit, will you show us where we have taken the Word of God lightly, that we need to steward it differently. So Father, we just do what we know how to do. We just say, wow, thanks for showing that to me. I'm sorry I've missed it. Sorry God, I've missed it in some places. I've been sloppy in obedience to your Word. I've just missed some opportunities. Father, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Holy Spirit, will you help me? Will you help me to see this area of my life differently according to the Word? Will you help me to respond to that area of my life differently? Lord, will you help me? Holy Spirit, uh, yeah, with the, the true repentance actually brings joy, not condemnation. So if you feel condemned, that's, a, that's from the enemy. Whoever that is in the room is feeling condemned. That's, that's from the enemy. True repentance actually brings joy. It's a place where God reveals something that he says, I want to help you change. And he actually says, listen, it's all right. Come with me. Father, I pray that you would help us to steward what you have given us. Help us to be faithful stewards for all that you've given us. I'll just take a minute.
Father, I thank you that ultimately you came to rescue us and save us. Lord, if there's anybody in the room today or watching online that does not know you, they've never made a decision for you, Jesus. I pray right now, would you pour your love out in their heart? Would you begin to knock on the door of their heart? If that's you, you might even feel your heart beginning to beat a little faster. Just have this revelation of knowing that God loves you. And I want to tell you, if, if that's you, he's pouring his love out on you right now. And the response to his love is to say thank you. He demonstrated his love when he sent Jesus to the cross to pay for all of your sins, all of your mistakes, everything that you've done wrong, everything that deserves punishment. Jesus came to pay for that. And if that's you, I want you just to say thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Jesus, will you forgive me of my sins? Will you forgive me of all of my mistakes? All those things that I deserve punishment for. Jesus, will you forgive me of those? That's why he went to the cross, was to forgive you, so you would not live under that torment or bondage anymore. But he wants you to live in freedom. And so if that's you, I want you just to say, thank you, God, that you sent your son Jesus to die for me. I thank you that you're forgiving me today. I'm yielding myself to you. And I ask you, Jesus, will you Will you be my Savior or will you be my Lord? There's some people in the room right now, you've never prayed this prayer. You've never welcomed him in. You've been part of church, you've never welcomed him. Right now, I'd encourage you to say that, just to say, God, I want to welcome Jesus into my heart to be my Lord and Savior, that I would live differently and see differently. Would you help me right now in this moment as I surrender my life to you? I thank you for the gift of salvation. Would you save me right now today, that I would not be deemed for eternal punishment, but I would be deemed for eternal life because of the work of one man, and his name was Jesus. I yield to him today. Holy Spirit, right now, will you help whoever that is in the room, whoever that is that's needing to make a decision for you, that person online that's needing to make a decision for you, we help them right now. Help them to surrender. And as you help them, would you make them new? Would you help them to to step into the born-again experience as a new believer right now in this moment? Father, we help us. We give us eyes to see how we've been living life. Lord, we help us to steward those things that you put in our hands. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Come on, give God praise for his word today. Listen, if that was you, whether you're online, you're in the room, and you're like, yes, I need to make a decision for Jesus today, and in your heart you just prayed that prayer, in your connection card on the inside, on the inside it says, I pray to receive Christ today. Would you check that off for me? Would you fill out the connection card? Would you drop it in one of the receptacles on your way out so that Pastor Chris can contact you and help you start taking steps in your walk with Jesus? Be blessed. Have an amazing day. If you need prayer today, there will be people down front to pray with you right now. And um, have an amazing, amazing Sunday afternoon.